actually have a, a Master of Information Science from Berkeley. And when you go up to 15 people, you actually get up to 105 connections. I think, you know, social networking has developed as a, as a genre of application online because people like the idea of being able to organize their contacts. So one of the things that I do, that I immediately did at Facebook, even though I'm on, I, I was already on a bunch of other social networks, um, was that they allowed me to better organize my contacts. So I went ahead and did the work to kind of set that up because it was so valuable to me. Conversely, once that was set up, it became a system for me where the only value was to contact someone and then jump off Facebook and communicate in another way. Because Facebook was fairly cumbersome, there's so many features and whatnot, and it's, it's just there's a lot going on, and I wanted simplicity. Um, and I felt more comfortable with simplicity. I think the first part is an important step in the evolution of why people would want to be on a social network or several. I'm on LinkedIn and my business contacts are there. I'm on Facebook and my friends are there. I'm in some other ones and I hardly go to them, but I mean, I did go and set them up because there's this sort of desire to organize and maintain the online address book, as it were. And Microblogging is um, is not so much about connecting to everyone that I know, but it's actually about following the people who I think say interesting things and that I might want to talk to. And that's a different set of people than who are my friends. I may have friends that I hang out with in person, and because we're friends, we should connect on Facebook. Or I may have friends who we just see each other at conferences, but we never otherwise talk to each other. But we connect on Facebook, and it's an organizational tool as opposed to a conversational tool. For me, microblogging is very much about who do I want to talk to? Now I'll connect with those people, and that's it. And then if lots of people want to follow me, you know, that's fine too. It's, um, but it's very much a statement about who I want to talk to every day versus who I want to be in my address book. Whenever we go to any online service where they've created a service somewhere away from us, so us, me, I exist at my computer, right? That's a node on the internet when I log in. So, or I somehow access the internet, I'm sort of a, an edge node. But when I go to that service and I spend time there, um, I'm giving, I'm creating value for them by spending time there. It's value for me, but it's also value for them. And so my view is, is that we should both own a copy of our data. But not everybody feels that way and not every service treats you that way. Many terms of service or terms of use at, at those external services say, you know, the company owns all the data. That's it. I love that Twitter and Identica and other companies have just stepped up and said, look, you own your data. We're just going to facilitate the moving around of that data because we provide this service. And we're not, in the case of Twitter, necessarily even going to use the data as the basis for providing advertising to you. Instead, we're going to figure out other ways to make money. And in fact, what Twitter's proposed is somewhat similar to Craigslist, which says, you know, people will, um, people who are, are business entities, when they engage in certain types of behavior, will pay a fee and that will underwrite the whole service, and Craigslist does very well with this. I would love to see Twitter do a similar thing, where my company would pay, the, pay to use the service, but me as an individual, that would be free. I think that's great.